This episode is made possible by Skillshare. Get your first month 100% free by following the link below. This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. We just did a major overhaul of our patrons-only Discord server, so if you'd like to join our growing community and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Let's do a thought experiment. Close your eyes and imagine you're a YouTuber making political explainer videos. Okay, don't actually close your eyes or you'll miss that gorgeous premium stock footage. And actually, don't imagine being a political YouTuber either or you'll fall into the deepest, most inescapable pit of sadness. You know what, just, just let me imagine it for you. Let me imagine that it's been almost two years since you made a video about the American political spectrum. It's your second most popular episode since the rebrand, but it's a measly 7 minutes and 26 seconds, and you just had so many more things to say. But let's be honest, you were kinda scared. You were a scared little man. Let's imagine your intern is writing all this, and it's starting to hurt your feelings, so we should really move on. Now, would you remake that video? But this time, allowing yourself to take a big dive into the deep end. Pfft, no, of course not. You're better than that. Well, I'm not. On this week's episode, we're looking at the American left in an international context and answering the question, why did socialism never really take root here? Let's talk about the American left first. The radical left. The left in this country, they don't give a damn about truth or justice. Everything on the left's collapsing across the board. They want to take your pickup truck. They want to rebuild your home. They want to take away your hamburgers. The Marxists, the anarchists, the agitators, the looters. You're in a cult. They get it wrong every single time. This is what Stalin dreamt about, but never achieved. They are determined to tear down every statue, symbol, and memory of our national heritage. When we talk about the left in this country, it's important to understand who that is. And for this episode, we mean the elected left, so really just the Democratic Party. There's a whole list of small parties and groups, each with its own plot of land on the political spectrum's left wing. But since they occupy next to no major elected positions and primarily operate through influence, they don't make for a very robust analysis of American electoral politics. So with all that in mind, we're really just going to focus on the blue team. Democrats are the center-left party in the US. Look, that's what it says right here on Wikipedia. But what's this? When you plot their voting records and party discourse on the political compass, the completely neutral, absolutely zero bias, omnipotently objective metric of what politics are, you don't get a center-left party. You get a center-right party. How come? The issue here is that left and right are relative terms. There is no objective left or objective right that holds true in every scenario and can reliably be attached to a certain set of policies across all of time and space. What is considered radical and progressive is constantly updated as political battles evolve. And by the same token, what is considered conservative or reactionary changes when the left succeeds in making its goals mainstays or the right reaches further back into the past for its political program. This basically means that in a country with only two viable parties, you're going to get one party that calls itself the right and one that calls itself the left regardless of where their parties end up on your political grid. They can't both claim to be on the same side, so those labels end up being about which team you like better, not some marker of absolute truth. So then, why does the compass look like that? Even if you disagree with its methodology, the reason that the political compass maps prominent American politicians so uniformly to the right, with really just one big centrist exception, hey you, is because it's trying to generalize the political spectrum beyond the limits of the United States and assess our politics relative to those of comparable countries, mainly other Western liberal republics. And compared to other so-called Western countries, the United States Democratic Party is a center-right party. It's the party of economic liberalism. Okay, let's look at the 2017 manifesto for the British Tory party, the conservative wing of Britain's own two-party system. Get ready to clutch your pearls, because there is some scary, downright hedonistic communist nonsense in there. Take a look what the manifesto says. We do not believe in untrammeled free markets. We reject the cult of selfish individualism. We abhor social division, injustice, unfairness, and inequality. We will run public services in accordance with their values as important local and national institutions. We will not only guarantee, but enhance workers' rights and protections. 
and we will develop our ambitious modern industrial strategy to get the economy working for everyone, across the whole of our nation. We believe in the good that government can do. Good God, lock them up, put them in commie jail, do something. Who even uses untrammeled? Oh God, why did I do a British accent? Those words come from the British right wing. And even though most of this is pretty shameless lying, the fact that this is the way they're selling their political program tells us a lot about where the left and the right stand in one of Western Europe's more conservative countries. Reigning in capitalism, providing social services, empowering workers, these are common sense, bare minimum mainstream policies that even a right-wing government can't justify denying its citizens. At least, not explicitly. And look at the Labour Party. They're also labeled center-left, according to Wikipedia. They're the main political opponent to the Tories, and when you plot them on the political compass, they end up remarkably close to our well-loved and always treated fairly by Fox News, definitely communists we have here in America. Labor's middle ground proposals that convince around half the nation include ensuring continued and supported access to their national healthcare system, reaching net zero carbon emissions by the 2030s, and the nationalization of key industries. These are policies that never make it to the outer left reaches of the Democratic Party, and are solidly in the mainstream left for the UK, barely qualifying as socialism there and in most other Western European countries for that matter. Not to mention countries where social democracy is even more well established and these policies are boilerplate centrism, or countries and areas that aren't as comparable to the US but where communist or socialist governments are fully established. If comparison to a relatively centrist, conservative government makes the US look so right-wing, what is there to say about explicitly left-wing places around the world? But if policy-by-policy policy comparisons aren't really your vibe, this view of the EU Parliament communicates essentially the same idea. The dark red group is communists. The lighter red color is socialists, and even though they, the Greens to their right, and the Communists to their left end up promoting mostly social democratic, not outwardly socialist politics in the short term, the ideological grounding they all draw from is largely anti-capitalistic, Marxist literature. And they are explicit about transcending social democracy over time and creating broad class consciousness in their electoral body. The left in Europe is just more left than the one we have here, and it actually gets a spot at the table albeit within an otherwise economically liberal institution and within social democratic limits. By contrast, liberal mainline US Democrats would probably end up in one of the blue groups around or just to the right of the center, with only a few figures within the party overlapping with the center left side of the chamber. What's up with that, you're now pondering, while I subtly redirect the topic of this video? How come Europe gets all that and I get not one crumb of economic democracy? Well, there are a couple reasons. If I did the classic YouTube explainer video thing, focusing on just one of them and pretending like it explained the whole question, you'd probably hurt my feelings in the comments. And I don't like that sort of thing. So there are a couple reasons labor politics never took root in the US in any major way, and none of them fully explains it on its own. Instead, they all overlap and reinforce one another, leading us to the place we are today with two ostensibly right-wing parties, of which only one has a tiny subcurrent with a somewhat left-wing political program. For starters, I should acknowledge that there is a substantial current of socialism in the US today, just like there has been at various times in history. The DSA and communist parties like the CPUSA have had record recruitment in recent years. Socialism has broad approval among younger generations, and political parties that represent some version of a socialist agenda have successfully shaped local politics and in a few cases have gained electoral success. Back at the start of the 20th century, socialist parties won several elections locally and nationally. A socialist candidate, Eugene V. Debs, earned around 6% of the national vote in a presidential election. And although isolated and very limited in number, communes structured around loosely socialist principles have existed around the country at various points in its history. Not to mention other important figures in the American socialist movement like MLK. Despite this, no major reformist or revolutionary socialist party has ever appeared the same way it has in many countries the US shares a common history with. Why? One big reason is our electoral system. The electoral college and first-past-the-post voting, in which you vote for one candidate and whoever has the most votes wins, even if that ends up being less than 50% support, ensures that only two parties ever govern. Every vote is tactical, and in that kind of environment, third parties struggle to make it through without accidentally becoming spoilers for one of the two bigger parties they're closer to. 
This means that at the end of the day, you don't end up having much of a choice and vote for the option you dislike the least. Democrats and Republicans can be confident they'll keep their job and no third party will ever pose a real threat to them so long as they don't screw things up in a seriously major way. Which they're apparently somehow still doing considering no third party poses a real challenge. At least not at the national level. Some figures within the Democratic Party can try to influence it and pull it further left. But there are obvious limits to that influence. And if it's too important, the party could just not let you run on their ticket. Still, that obviously doesn't explain why one of those two parties couldn't be more left-wing right off the bat. The way that a somewhat socialistic party like Labour exists in the UK. Another country with first-past-the-post voting. So voting alone doesn't give us the whole picture. But looking at historical developments can help with that. The big one is the Red Scare, which poisoned the well on words like socialism, communism, and anarchism. Propaganda efforts, government crackdowns, imprisonments, and union busting across the country tried to subdue American labor movements, and man, it worked really well. Organizing on socialist ideals or being a leftist of any form was practically illegal, and downright un-American, unchristian, godless, or even satanic in much of the public discourse. We still feel the echoes of that movement today with every mild social policy being branded as socialism doing enough to make half the country hate it. Here, have some nepotism and go watch my buddy Ugopnik's video about it, and you'll see what I mean. Ultimately, it's going to be decades until this history can be fully overcome by the majority of the American public, and you can finally live out what communism is really about, telling other people you're a communist. But even the Red Scare and voting systems don't fully explain why socialism hasn't taken hold. After all, many countries with social democratic or leftist parties further to our left like Spain, Italy, and Germany in the West, and India and China outside the imperial core have had equally, if not more brutal, Red Scare-like movements. According to American historian Eric Foner, another variable to take into account is straight-up organizational failures. Too much compromise at some times, not enough at other times, the socialist and communist parties of the US couldn't always make it work sustainably and often picked the wrong battles when it came to organizational survival. They couldn't unify enough of the American public under the same banner, couldn't fight the cultural battles that they were the target of by the state, couldn't get the legitimacy their European siblings did. Ultimately, they didn't last in such a hostile environment because of both their choices and their constraints. This is just another piece to the puzzle, and Foner's work is quick to point out that it isn't any more satisfying of an answer than the other two. And this lack of a satisfying answer sadly testifies to the strength of the capitalist economy and its ability to adapt to the socialist challenge, constantly mutating in its operation to make its exploitative nature survive in some new way. From factory floors, to white-collar corporatism, to the gig economy, and to its future incarnation in whatever consumerist hell the metaverse will be. Its political and economic arms have always found new ways to respond to its challengers. Even if the left is more developed in other capitalist countries, it isn't really socialism there either. Even if other places have socialist and communist parties at their helm, they are forced to compromise with a capitalist global economy and the military power of its greatest supporter at some point. The question, why doesn't the US have a socialist party, ultimately has the same answer as, why hasn't socialism replaced capitalism? Capitalism has created an environment in which socialism is both more likely to arise and simultaneously more difficult to achieve. Few are those who have been able to make some version of it work. But enough of this doom and gloom. All socialists should be optimistic. Not blindly optimistic, not ignorant of the very real challenges our movement faces, but optimistic based on the belief that humanity has always been able to overcome roadblocks like capitalism. Massive structural problems always seem insurmountable until suddenly they're not. There will come a time when capitalism stumbles a little too severely, when the weight of all its past failures provide an opening for the people to take charge and say, we're trying something new. I believe that time is coming and that it's closer than most of us think. You probably weren't taught about it in history class, but Lenin himself thought he would never see revolution in his lifetime. Two years later, he was helping to guide one of the most significant events in modern history. If we want to make sure that our eventual revolution is successful, that socialism can flourish in the United States, we need to plant the seed in fertile ground, educate ourselves and our peers, push back against capitalist propaganda, help those who are struggling under the current system, and look towards the future with optimism. 
the American left may be lacking today, but we'll make sure it's stronger tomorrow. This isn't the first time I've encouraged us all to continue learning and improving ourselves, and it definitely won't be the last. But I've gotten a few comments recently asking how exactly we should do that. Well, reading theory is always valuable, but there's more to learning than just picking up a copy of State and Revolution. One way I like to discover new things is by taking classes on Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes and members across 150 countries. Whether you're interested in video production, graphic design, cooking, or gardening, Skillshare will have something to interest you and help you learn something new. Personally, I've wanted to start appearing on camera more often, and that meant I had to update my office and brush up on my studio lighting skills. Lighting has always been the bane of my existence, so I was super relieved to find Jordi Vandeput's Introduction to Lighting for Videography course. Over a few bite-sized lessons, I went from struggling to get the look I wanted to being confident that I could effectively light my scene. And that's what Skillshare is all about. No matter your skill level, you can find a course that will help you deepen your understanding and improve that skill. And if you manage somehow to blow through all the thousands of classes Skillshare has to offer, new premium courses are added every single week. So you'll never run out of things to discover. So, whether there's a specific skill you've been meaning to learn, or you just want to branch out and try something new, Skillshare is the perfect place to start. If you'd like to help support my channel and get a head start on learning your next favorite skill, be one of the first 1,000 people to join Skillshare using the link below, and get your first month absolutely free. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.